Okay class, so this is now a recorded uh, discussion on our last topic, adsorption. I uh, was not able to record the previous one given in class, so I hope this would suffice. So I'll go back again to what we've been uh, discussing on the process or the separation process adsorption so as an introduction i will discuss what the adsorption process is so it is of course not the same as the same as absorption so when we speak of absorption it has something to do with molecules being incorporated in the matrix of the one that absorbs it but in the case of adsorption it is only something that is superficial it's something that is only happening on the surface of the one that is absorbing or shall we say on the surface of the adsorbent so in here components of a gas or liquid so we talk about fluids are absorbed on the surface of the adsorbent so the adsorbent is usually placed in a fixed bed although it could be fluidized bed and it could even be one that is a moving bed adsorption process now in adsorption process fluid is passed through the bed where solid particles adsorbents absorb component from the liquid so it is the solid bed particles that gets the component of interest from the fluid by the process of adsorption so saturated adsorbent meaning the adsorbent that has already adsorbed or has 100% of its surface area already absorbing the component to be transferred from the fluid is most of the time being regenerated and used again. Now we have two uh, general classes in which we could apply adsorption processes. So one is the liquid phase adsorption where uh, separation of paraffins from aromatics uh, is a classic example and the separation of fructose from glucose in the mixture of the two. Now in the case of gas phase adsorption, we have it in the removal of some unwanted contaminants or some components in the gas mixture. So in this case, it could be H2S or CS2 or other other causing components in the air. So the recovery of such thing is always by the use or most of the time through the use of organic solvents. Uh, or shall I say this is most of the time involving organic solvents of paints in air. So we want to deodorize air by taking away the presence of the organic solvents in it. So that is in the case of gas phase adsorption. Now as to physical properties of adsorbents, what are these that we need to know or what are the needed properties of the adsorbent that way they will accomplish their purpose. So this adsorbent, first and foremost, we will define as the artificial and naturally occurring solids with a highly developed surface uh, which readily adsorbs matter from solutions surrounding the adsorbent bed. Now, so their properties, so the properties of these adsorbents are actually dependent on its chemical composition, its physical surface condition, the degree of its porosity, and its specific surface area so actually the last two is very important when it comes to its degree of recovering a particular component from a fluid now adsorbents now this time their special characteristic that is adsorbents must have so number one high abrasion resistance so they are they should have this resistance to abrasion meaning their surface cannot be easily scratched then they should have high thermal stability and small pore diameter i think the small pore diameter is already a given because we don't want that our component to be taken from the fluid will be uh, incorporated in the matrix or in the inside the structure of our adsorbent it should only be at should be at the surface of the adsorbent so as such the pore diameters have to be small being highly ther uh, being thermally stable means that even if temperature changes the properties of the adsorbent should not be affected 
and the distinct pore structure here means that the pore structure should not be altered when the process is already uh, ongoing the process of absorption that is so meaning the pore should not either enlarge or uh, shall I say reduce in diameter while the process is going on now most industrial adsorbents flow into one of the three classes that you are seeing in your screen so one of the three classes is oxygen containing compounds and since they are oxygen containing compounds they are polar in nature and they are hydrophilic as uh, the term implies that it is a water loving so water is a polar solvent now this include materials such as the silica gel and the zeolites now the carbon based compounds are those that are hydrophobic and they are non-polar and the most common example and most commonly used adsorbent is the activated carbon and we have also graphite for this now the last one is the polymer based compounds or these are the resins they are neither polar or non-polar and their functional groups are of course na water loving neither water loving or water heating uh, substances now they are having porous polymer matrix so simply put these polymer substances need not be polar need not be non-polar so it could be neither of the two also as long as they have this they are having porous polymer matrix now we we'll talk now about the examples of adsorbents and on top of the list is the activated carbon so it's highly uh, adsorbent and it's form of, it's a form of carbon powdered carbon uh, made from the thermal decomposition of wood coconut shells or some of the sources palm shells oil husks and even sawdust so for this activated carbon the surface area ranges from 300 to 1200 square meter per gram with an average pore diameter of 10 to 60 angstrom now as two applications so it's used in groundwater purification the dechlorination of processed water water purification even for swimming pools and the polishment of treated uh, effluent or the polishing of treated effluents so activated carbon is actually being used generally in uh, water treatment now we have here second example is the silica gel so this one is granular this is porous and is made of silicon dioxide now it was made by acid treatment of sodium silicate solution to produce something that is gelatinous and that could be washed with water and in the process after is dehydrated now the surface area here ranges from 600 to 800 square meter per gram with an average pore diameter of 20 to 5 angstrom. So the application of silica gel is in drying of processed air. So take note the fluid now is gas and in the adsorption of heavy hydrocarbons from natural gas. And since its application is on gases, it could be used as a drying agent. So that's your silica gel and that's the reason why we have these silica, silica gel packets in our shoe boxes or anything or anything package that uh, we want or that moisture content should be checked or there should not be uh, more than the moisture content that is given or that is uh, acceptable for such a packing. So we the packing normally contains these packets or this small uh, packings of silica gel now we have activated alumina so this activated alumina is a highly porous material manufactured from hydrated aluminum oxide by heating to drive off the water so surface area this time ranges from 200 to 500 square meters per gram with an average pore diameter of 20 to 140 angstrom now applications include catalyst as a catalyst and fluoride adsorbent so it's actually taking out fluoride from a particular fluid mixture 
Now we have molecular sieve zeolites. So these are microporous and luminous silicate minerals that form an open crystal lattice containing precisely uniform pores. So different zeolites have pore sizes from 3 angstrom to 10 angstrom. Application is more on the gas, so drying of processed air, CO2 removal, CO removal, air separation, catalytic cracking, and in the catalytic synthesis and reforming processes. So our zeolites are those adsorbents. Now we also have synthetic polymers or resins, probably or mo uh, mostly under the third classification. So these are made by, so we polymerize two major types of monomers which are aromatics and acrylic. So the joining of two monomers now producing a polymer. So they are aromatics or they can either be aromatics and acrylic referring to the monomers. Now as to the application, they are used to decolorize sugar solution and recover antibiotics and plant extracts and protein from a particular mixture. Now, what are the uh, important principles of adsorption that we need to understand? Although, uh, if you already read in advance in your book, a majority of the process, if you are using Genku, please are graphical. But if you're going to refer to McCabe, there are uh, sample problems that does not uh, really limit the use to graphical techniques so what are these principles of adsorptions adsorption rather so as in the case of fixed bed adsorption meaning the adsorbent is not moving it is the fluid that is being introduced through the bed concentration in the fluid phase and in the solid phase is expected of course to change with time as well as with position in the bed so as the fluid passes through the adsorbent, the solid bed adsorbent, we expect that the adsorbent, of course, will change its concentration in the same way that the fluid will also change its concentration over time. And with respect to the distance that that particular fluid has already covered in the bed, it will also be changing. So concentration is changing with time with position in the bed now most of the mass transfer in this case take note will occur near the entrance of the bed or the point where the fluid to be undergoing adsorption is introduced so where the fluid first contacts with the adsorbent after some time most of the mass transfer occur farther from the inlet meaning no mass transfer will already occur in the inlet part, it's because that particular location or position in your, in your bed is said to be already saturated, meaning your solid adsorbent has already likely more or less 99 to 100% of its surface fully covered by the recovered uh, component from the fluid. So region where most of the change in the concentration of the fluid and of the adsorbent is called the mass transfer zone. As you can see here, if this is the entire height or length of the bed, uh, as the fluid enters the bend, there is this increase in the concentration. By the way, this is ratio concentration over initial concentration of the component in the fluid mixture. So initially we have 1.0 and then this particular uh, ratio of the concentration at any particular time to initial concentration will drop. It will drop, it's because your component is already getting absorbed in the bed. The way it drops here is based on the this one, the time. So uh, it takes time one for the concentra concentration ratio to drop from 1.0 to this particular value here. After some time, even if even if the flow of the fluid continues in this direction in your bed, there won't be any adsorption anymore that will occur here. It's because you're solid over time is already saturated so the constant the adsorption process will commence on the next zone then after this next zone gets to be saturated it will again be uh, 
I shall I say, moving forward, that is the manner in which the concentration of the fluid decreases with the initial contents concentration it would also be moving forward in this manner meaning as we proceed along the entire length of the bed the the regions in which we say are already saturated won't have any uh, mass transfer that will be occurring the mass transfer will happen on the next section so the next section wherein the adsorbers are not, as, as we say, they are not yet saturated or spent. Now, talking about that, so we have this what we call the breakthrough curve. And it points out to us the break point. What is this break point? This is the maximum concentration that can be discarded. So, meaning after this point, we can already discard or we need not collect the, the fluid or just so let's say discard the fluid that has been already processed in the entire bed because its concentration is only around 1 to 5% of the initial feed concentration. So, this region is the discarded region. Why what is left of the fluid is just around 1 to 5% of its initial concentration. Why is that? It's because majority of your component was already absorbed in this area here. So after this area, we have this point which says to us, uh, the concentration ratio at this point is already 50% because the break point or the breakthrough point is actually 50%. The C over CO is already 50%, 50% only of the initial concentration. Now, as breakthrough continues, the concentration of the adsorbate in the effluent increases gradually up to the point CD. So, after some time, it will still need increase a little, but after that, it won't anymore. So, this is the, shall we say, the remaining mass transfer zone after the breakthrough point where we can or we can actually, uh, we are allowed to discard already the fluid because anyway, what is remaining there is just 1 to 5% of the feed concentration. So, this is our, actually, our breakthrough profile concentration profile in a fluid at the outlet of the bed now as two adsorption principles what is the effect of feed concentration is there the, there is there an effect as to the degree of adsorption with feed concentration so shall we we will see now since the width of the mass transfer zone does not change the width that is this one, this one, the width does not change. Effect of the moderate changes in feed concentration on the breakthrough point can be determined. So the effect of the changes in the concentration over the value of the breakthrough point can still be determined. Now, how do we scale up our design? So we have something that is done only in the laboratory, then we will apply that in the actual design of what is in the industry already. So adsorbers are scaled up from laboratory test in a small diameter bed and the large unit is designed for the same particle size and superficial velocity. Meaning in the lab, they use the small diameter bed and later on in the industry, they will scale it up. They will scale it up but take note, they will use the same particle size and superficial velocity that was used in the laboratory experiment. So the scale-up principles is that the amount of the unused solid or length of the unused bed does not change with the total bed length. So meaning if we have a smaller bed or a bigger bed, the ratio of the bed that was unused to the total bed length is the same we, whether we're using the one that is in the lab, meaning the small adsorption equipment or the one that is in the street, which is already big, meaning in terms of ratio and proportion, they are exactly the same. Only that we are making a bigger one in the industry. But take note, the ratio 
the ratio of the end use bed whether in the lab or in the industry is just the same the ratio with the entire length of the bed that is now, as to the formula that we could use in terms of problems concerning adsorption processes determining the break put break point time without having to rely on rigged outs from the profile because if a problem gives you the concentration profile you can plot actually and then you will have a curve then after you have the curve you will get that particular point where the ratio of the c to the c sub o is 50 percent as to what is the time in which the C over CO is 0.5, that would be the break point or the breakthrough point. Now, we need not rely on that because we have a formula here that is based on the length of the unused bed and the total bed length together with the time when C over CO is equal to 0.5. And that particular formula is this. Now, from this particular formula also we can have this one wherein the length of the bed used up to break point is actually also a fraction or in the same ratio as the total bed capacity utilized to break point. The total bed capaci capacity utilized up to break point is the ratio of TU to TT. It's just a fraction or simply the fraction of the total bed capaci capacity that was uh, used up during break point or up to break point and h of t is the total bed length now as to batch adsorption uh, we often use this to adsorb solids from liquid solutions when the quantities of course are small just like in any processes now this may consist of contacting an adsorbent with another material for a given period of time and as such we say batch and after some time we take out the solids the adsorbents and we expect already that the components that need to be transferred from the liquid has already adsorbed on its surface so expect the concentration of the fluid or the solution will decrease now at equilibrium, we have this formula in determining the amount of solute adsorbed per unit amount of adsorbent or how much was the solute absorbed per unit amount of adsorbent that was used. Okay, And K is the constant which is determined experimentally just like N. And the C is the solute concentration in the solution. Now, equation 1 here is comparable to the rate law equation in kinetics or even in FICEM as discuss, uh, where it discusses also kinetics. This K and this N are also empirically determined. Now, another equation that we can use is the material balance equation wherein we account for the amount of solute initially present and the amount of solute after adsorption already commenced. So, S is a volume of feed solution. So, this is for the feed. These terms are for the feed. And M is the amount of the adsorbent. So, this is the adsorbent. The CF and the C represents the concentrations of the feed initial and final, F being the uh, initial concentration of the feed and C is the final concentration. The QF is the initial concentration of the solute and Q is the final concentration which is also the equilibrium concentration. Now equation 1 and 2 can be solved numerically or graphically. But in the case of graphical solution, you can plot equation 1 and 2 on the same coordinate plane. And the intersection of the two plots shows the solution concentration and the ad adsorbent loading at equilibrium. This is supposed to be class adsorbent loading. So you will get two values when you intersect the two plots of equation 1 and 2. One will be the solution concentration at equilibrium and the adsorbent or how much is the concentration of the adsorbent at equilibrium. That is referring to the adsorbent loading, the concentration of the adsorbent at equilibrium. And what is meant by that is this line. So you have this equilibrium line and this is your operating line. The intersection will give you the concentration of the solution Y and the concentration of the 
adsorbent based on the amount of solute that it adsorbed. So Q. Now the fixed bed adsorb adsorption is widely used method for adsorption of solutes from liquids or gases employing a fixed bed of granular particles. So fixed bed. Fluid to be treated usually passes down through the pack bed at a constant rate. So it's the fluid that is passed through the bed. Mass transfer resistances here are important in the fixed bed process. And this process is unsteady state. Now, what are processing variables and adsorption cycles? So, when we speak of large-scale adsorption processes, we already done with batch. There are two types of system. We have the cyclic batch system and we have the continuous flow system. In the cyclic batch system, the adsorption fixed bed is alternately saturated and then regenerated in a cyclic manner. So meaning after the bed is already saturated, it is being regenerated and another bed is uh, being introduced. That way it's already the one that's going to accept the fluid to be processed or it's something that is being cycled. You have two beds, for example, as one bed is being used in the adsorption, the other one is regenerated. After the regeneration of the other one, uh, it will be the first one that will be used in the process and the previously uh, and the previous system that was used is the one that is being regenerated. So it's just one thing. If one is regenerated, the other one is being used. If one is being used, the other one is regenerated. In the case of continuous flow system, this involves a continuous flow of adsorbent counter current to the flow of feed. So meaning the adsorbent together with the feed are flowing as they enter the adsorption chamber. And the flow is take note counter current. And there are four basic common methods that is used in regenerating a fixed bed. Okay, four basic methods that is used in regenerating the fixed bed. Uh, in here, the, we have two or sometimes three fixed beds in parallel. Oftentimes, you only have two fixed beds or it could even be increased up to three. Regeneration in the first bed is done using any of the following methods. So meaning the first bed is being regenerated while the other two is processing the fluid where the solute is to be adsorbed. We have one of the four is the thermal swing cycle or we call this the temperature swing cycle. The spent adsorption bed here is regenerated by heating with it with embedded stream coils or with a hot purge gas to remove the adsorbate. The adsorbate that remains on the adsorbent are being removed removed by purging it with hot gas or stream. The time for regeneration for this is generally a few hours or more. Now in the pressure swing process, we're not using temperature, but it's now pressure. So the bed is deserved by reducing the pressure, meaning lowering its, lowering its pressure at essentially constant temperature, and then purging the bed at this low pressure with a small fraction of the product stream. So what you use in purging the adsorbent is a small fraction of the product stream. This process for gases uses a very short cycle time. So the pressure swing cycle is used for gases. Then we have the inert purge gas stripping cycle. The adsorbate here is removed by passing a non-absorbing or inert gas through the bed. The regeneration cycle times are usually only a few minutes. So what is being utilized here is a non-absorbing inert gas to take away the adsorbed particles on the surface of the adsorbent. The last is the displacement purge cycle. Here, both pressure and temperature are kept constant as in purge gas stripping, so just like the previous uh, process, but a gas or liquid is used that is absorbed more strongly than the adsorbate and it displaces the adsorbate. So, uh, we are not using here anymore an inert gas absorbate, but rather we're using an adsorb 
a gas or a liquid that will have a greater affinity, shall I say, to the adsorbent and as such, it will replace in the adsorbent surface the adsorbate. So the, the adsorbate now is removed because this particular gas or liquid is more affiliated to that adsorbent. So as the adsorbate is being removed in the adsorbent surface, we are regenerating the adsorbent. So cycle times here are usually only a few minutes. So stripping or steam stripping is often used in regenerating of solvent recovery systems using activated carbon so take note one of the process of regenerating acti activated carbon as an adsorbent is the displacement purge cycle here it's stated and what is being used is stream stripping as for adsorption isotherms or what are this in the first place? So when we speak of adsorption isotherms, they are simply curves relating the equil equilibrium concentration of a solute on the surface of the adsorbent that is already Q to the concentration of the solute in the liquid C with which it is in contact. So simply put, it is the concentration of the solution and it is the concentration of the adsorbent. And where do we get the concentration of the adsorbent? Because the adsorbent in itself is solid. It is the concentration of the adsorbate that is adhering on the surface of the adsorbent. As you can see on the graph on figure 12.1-1, this one is a linear relationship whereas Front Luch and Langmuir are all curve so giving you the relationship between q and c as defined in here so linear the equation is that of a line fruit luch is of course curve the curve this is front luch isotherm and we have langmuir another curve the langmuir isotherm so it's not linear it's also curve now in here q is the concentration of the adsorbate K is the adsorption constant, C the concentration of the adsorbate in solution, and N is a constant as well. The K and the N are determined graphic, uh, empirically or by experiment. The Q max is the maximum adsorption capacity for forming a single layer where adsorption will occur. As two adsorption equipments, we have fixed bed adsorbents, adsorbers rather, which utilize a stationary adsorbent to filter streams. So stationary, it's not moving. Important properties include pressure drop and life expectancy of the adsorbent, which are very predictable in this type of systems or design. Meaning, if you are utilizing a fixed bed adsorber, over time you would know uh, what would be the life of the adsorbent, adsorbent particles that are being used in your bed. It's very simple in terms of design and relatively inexpensive to fabricate. Now, most common processing scheme is a pair of adsorbents in this case, and the number of adsorbers are selected based on optimization of overall process operation and cost benefits. So, in the case of fixed bed adsorbents, if you want to make it a cyclic continuous process, you need a pair so that when one is being regenerated, the other one is being used. One that is being used once already spent will be regenerated and the one that has been regenerated will be the one to be used. It's a cyclic thing. Applications ranging from large industrial operations for this to remove harmful VOCs or volatile organic carbons to small consumer uses as filters and gas masks. Now these are uh, illustrations of the fixed bed adsorbers. Fluidized bed adsorbers, on the other hand, utilizes a more complex moving fluidized adsorbent to filter streams. So the adsorbent is fluidized, moving, achieving by inducing a stream velocity high enough to suspend the adsorbent particles. So the, actually, it is the velocity of the fluid itself that keeps the adsorbent particles suspended. High energy cost is expected compared to the fixed bed adsorbers and behavior of fluidized beds is much harder to predict since much is still unknown in terms of its design.
It requires a large chamber and is usually only implemented, take note, in high volume industrial applications. And this is an example of a fluidized bed adsorber. As to a moving bed adsorber, the adsorbent can be kept to a minimum value or volume. Heat transfer is better compared to a fixed bed absorber. So this one is an improvement of the simple design of the fixed bed absorber. However, since this is an improvement, it in terms of design, it's more complex and more expensive to operate. Attrition of absorbent particles is expected. When we speak of attrition class, over time, some of the, uh, shall I say, adsorbate on your adsorbent get removed. So it is what we meant with attrition. Attrition of adsorbent particles. Now, this is the end for the topic of adsorption. I will pose in canvas as to what would be your corresponding assignment in terms of a sample problem to read with no needed thing to comply just read that way it can complement what has been discussed in this slide thank you for listening class